Well, this morning, um, we're continuing in the book of Matthew. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 15 this week, and, and we've been in this series since the, the second week of December, so it's been a while now. Uh, it's been fun going through um, this gospel, and we're about halfway through the book of Matthew. Can you believe it? And so we'll, we'll wrap up uh, this, uh, this series the week after Easter, um, but we're about halfway through it right now. And um, this passage uh, is, is a really amazing passage in, in Matthew chapter 15. We're going to talk about uh, the faith of the Canaanite woman. But uh, before we do that, I want to just show you a quick video this morning um, that kind of gives an overview. As I said, we're about halfway through, and it'll give us kind of an overview of what we're looking forward to from Matthew 15, or actually it'll start in 14 through the end of the book. Go ahead and watch that. The Gospel according to Matthew. In the first video, we saw how Matthew introduced Jesus as the Messiah from the line of David and as a new authoritative teacher like Moses, and also as Emmanuel, which in Hebrew means God with us. After Jesus announced and taught about the arrival of God's kingdom, and after he brought the kingdom into day-to-day -day life among the people of Israel, we saw that Jesus was accepted by many, but rejected by others, especially Israel's religious leaders, the Pharisees. And so the big question is, how is this conflict between Jesus and Israel's leaders going to play itself out? The next large section, chapters 14 through 20, explore all of the different expectations people have about the Messiah. So Jesus keeps healing sick people, and twice he even miraculously provides food for these huge crowds in the desert. One made up of Jewish people, and the other is a non-Jewish crowd. And this sign is very similar to what Moses did for Israel in the wilderness. And so all of these people are excited about Jesus. They think he's the great prophet and the Messiah, but not the religious leaders. Their view of the Messiah is built on passages like Psalm 2 or Daniel chapter 2 about a victorious Messiah who's going to deliver Israel and defeat the pagan oppressor. And from their point of view, Jesus, he's a false teacher, he's making blasphemous claims about himself, and so there are stories here about them increasing their opposition, hatching a plan to kill him. And so in response, Jesus, he withdraws, and he begins teaching his closest disciples what it means for him to be Israel's Messiah, because it is not what anybody expects. So Jesus asks his disciples, chapter 16, he says, who do you all say that I am? And Peter comes up with the right answer, it seems. He says, well, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. But then it becomes clear that Peter's thinking about a king who's going to reign victoriously through military power. And Jesus challenges Peter, saying that, yes, I am going to become king, but through a different way. And so Jesus starts to teach on themes from the prophet Isaiah, who said that the Messianic king would suffer and die for the sins of his own people. And so Jesus, he was positioning himself as a messianic king who reigned by becoming a servant and who would lay down his life for Israel and the nations. Well, Peter and the disciples, they mostly just don't get it. And so Jesus enters into the fourth block of teaching followed by a series of teachings after that. And these are all about the upside down nature of Jesus' messianic kingdom, which turns upside down all of our value systems. So in the community of the servant king, you gain honor by serving others. And instead of getting revenge, you forgive and do good to your enemies. And in Jesus' kingdom, you gain true wealth by giving your wealth away to the poor. To follow the servant Messiah, you must become a servant yourself. In the next section, we watch the two kingdoms clash. Jesus' kingdom and that of Israel's leaders. Jesus comes to Jerusalem for Passover, riding in on a donkey. And the crowds are hailing him as the Messiah. And Jesus immediately marches into the courtyard of the temple and he creates this huge disruption that brings the daily sacrifices to a halt. His actions speak louder than words here. As Israel's king, Jesus was asserting his royal authority over the temple, the place where God and Israel met together. And in Jesus' view, the temple was compromised by the hypocrisy of Israel's leaders. And so here he's challenging their authority and naturally, they're deeply offended. And so they try to trap Jesus and shame him in public debate, and they fail. So they end up just determining to have him killed. In response, Jesus delivers his final block of teaching. He first offers this 
passionate critique of the Pharisees and their hypocrisy. And then he weeps over Jerusalem and its rejection of God and his kingdom. Then Jesus withdraws with the disciples and he starts telling them what's going to happen. He's going to be executed by these leaders, but in doing so, they're going to create their own demise. Because instead of accepting Jesus' way of the peaceful kingdom, they're going to take the road of revolt against Rome, and so Jerusalem and its temple are going to be destroyed. But, Jesus says, that is not the end of the story. He's going to be vindicated after his death by his resurrection. And one day, he'll return and set up his kingdom over all nations. And so in the meanwhile, the disciples need to stay alert and stay committed to just announcing Jesus and his kingdom and spreading the good news. And so with all of that ringing in the disciples' ears, the story comes to its climax. That night, Jesus takes the disciples aside and he celebrates a Passover meal with them. The Passover retells the story of Israel's rescue from slavery through the death of the Passover lamb. And then Jesus takes the bread and the wine from this meal as new symbols, showing that his coming death would be a sacrifice that would redeem his people from slavery to sin and evil. After the meal, Jesus is arrested. He's put on trial before the Sanhedrin, a council of Jewish people. And they reject his claim to be the Messiah. They charge him with blasphemy against God. Then Jesus is brought before the Roman governor, Pilate. And he thinks Jesus is innocent. But he gives in to the pressure from the Jewish leaders, and he sentences Jesus to death by crucifixion. So Jesus is led away by Roman soldiers and crucified. Now, you'll notice right here in this section that just like Matthew did in the opening chapters, he increases the number of references to the Old Testament. He's trying to show that Jesus' death was not a tragedy or a failure. Rather, it was the surprising fulfillment of all of the old prophetic promises. Jesus came as the servant Messiah, spoken of by Isaiah. He was rejected by his own people, but instead of judging them, he is judged on their behalf, bearing the consequences of their sin. So the crucifixion scene, it comes to a close, and Jesus' body is placed but the book ends with a surprising twist, the last chapter. The disciples, they discover on Sunday morning that Jesus' tomb is empty. And then, all of a sudden, people start seeing Jesus alive from the dead. And the book concludes with the risen Jesus giving a final teaching called the Great Commission. Jesus says that he is now the true king of the world. And so he sends his disciples out to all nations with the good news that Jesus is Lord and that anyone can join his kingdom by being baptized and by following his teaching. And echoing all the way back to his name, Emmanuel, God with us from chapter one, Jesus' last words in the book to his disciples are, I will be with you. It's a promise of Jesus' presence until the day he finally returns. And that's the gospel according to Matthew. So you can, you can see where we're headed, right? There's, there's a lot to get to. There's a lot to go through. Um, but we're going we're gonna to just pick it up in uh, Matthew chapter 15 today. And just before we get into the, the text this morning, I want to share something um, kind of personal um, that I went to a, a prayer and fasting retreat back in the fall, this uh, last, last fall, I should say, and um, one of the speakers at that prayer and fasting retreat is a guy named Doug Lowenberg, and uh, he's a missionary and has been in the country of Kenya for a number of years, and he spoke on this passage, and it was one of those moments um, where it just like, you know, one of those messages that was like, yes, I needed to hear exactly that at this moment, and I started thinking about it like, there are certain times in my life where I remember a message being preached that was incredibly impactful on me, and I can still remember details about it to this day, that it was transformational in my life, that it actually um, made me think about it to the extent where, where it actually changed something in my life. And in reality, um, if you go to church on a regular basis, once a week you're, you're hearing a sermon, maybe you even listen to something online as well, and there are a million things that you've heard and that go in one ear and out the other, and you couldn't remember the next day what the pastor even preached on, much less anything significant enough to change your life. And I started thinking about those moments and those messages that I remember, and there was a message 
on Elijah being taken up into heaven that was really um, impactful to me. There was a message in, on Gideon. Um, there was a message on the calling of King Saul and another one on David and others that I could name that, that have been memorable in the past years. But I started to think about it and honestly, I couldn't even remember who preached that message half the time. I began to think about that. I'm like, huh. Like, it wasn't about this incredibly packaged message um, that, that was presented in such an incredible way that it was just so memorable. It was more about the moment that I was going through because I do remember, maybe not who spoke the message, but the moment of my life where I heard it. And I remember um, in those moments... A lot of times it had to do with my receptiveness to hearing God's word, the fact that I was tuned in and turned on to what God had to speak to me, and his word is powerful. So it doesn't really matter who's sharing it, it's his word that changes us when we're ready to listen, and we're ready to allow it to impact us and change us. And I remember that at this prayer and fasting retreat, we, we were gathered together. We had been praying. We had been fasting. And, and it was just a moment where I was just open to hear what God had to speak to me. And I say that all to make this point. I'm going to preach the word today, and I'm going to try to do it in an accurate way and in an effective way. But here's the deal. If you aren't open to what God wants to speak to you today, it's going to go in one ear and right out the other. A great message, Pastor. That was a great word for somebody. <laughs> I wish they were here, <laughs> right? If that's your attitude, when you come to church every week, you'll never get anything out of it, right? But if you're ready to receive and you're ready to hear, God's word can be transformational for you. Not because I was so good today, but because it's the word of God, right? So if we're open and we're willing to let it change us and, and we're willing to hear that, then God can use preaching in a powerful way. All right, so Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. We're going to start there and I'm going to kind of walk through this passage and pause and stop and talk along the way. So we'll, we'll get through it eventually. Uh, verse 21, and Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Now, um, from there, let's, let's explain where that is. In the past few weeks, we've been talking about Jesus ministering uh, in Capernaum, in this area around the Sea of Galilee. And so that was the area that he was leaving. That was kind of his base of operations for his ministry time. It was where he called most of the disciples from. And it was in this area that much of Jesus' ministry happened. And so he went and left that area and went to the area of Tyre and Sidon, which is probably about 35 to 40 miles based on the way that, that he would have traveled, traveled. So as the crow flies, it's shorter than that, but you would have had to go through a mountain range. So he probably had to go north and then turn to the, to the east. And so he headed to this region and traveled this great distance. And this was an intentional journey. And I want you to understand this as we read the rest of the story, that Jesus wasn't just trying to get away from people and get away for a little bit. He could have probably gone about a mile away into the wilderness and found some time alone. But he was headed to this place for a purpose. And verse 22 says, And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, my daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Now, a couple things to note about this woman. Uh, first of all, we don't know how this woman's daughter became demon-possessed. Um, we know that the, the Canaanite people from this region, that there was um, a lot of idolatry practiced and idol worship, and, and, but we don't know exactly how this young girl became oppressed by this demon. But it happened, and she's in a desperate place, in a desperate position. Her daughter's being tormented by this demon. And the second thing we can notice is that she knows who Jesus is. Now, like in today's world, it's not hard to understand how somebody from 
30, 40 miles away, like, like somebody from Lakeville, where I used to live, um, would maybe know somebody from Delano, where I live now. That's a pretty normal thing in our world today, because we have these things called cars, right? And so 30 to 40 miles is, is a short journey, and it's not a big deal at all. And not only that, we have electronic communication. We can send text messages. We have pictures online. There are ways of identifying people all around the world. But in this first century moment here, for her to know who Jesus was is a pretty remarkable thing. And in fact, she says something specific here. She says, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Now, this is a reference to the kingship of Jesus Christ. She's recognizing that he's in the lineage of King David. And so she's not only recognizing him as this guy who's been performing miracles and that she's been hearing about from the, sea of, from the region of the Sea of Galilee. No, she's recognizing that he's the promised Messiah. Now that is a big deal because, frankly, most people don't understand that. Only Jesus' disciples really got that at this point. And so for her to recognize not only that he's this Jesus guy that everybody's been talking about, but that he is the son of David, the the rightful king, is a big deal. Now, Jesus does something in this moment that's so unlike Jesus. (laughs) I want you to, to get this. She said that to him, "'Have mercy on me, O son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon.'" Seems like a pretty, you know, um, big statement there. Jesus, verse 23, but he did not answer her a word. He ignored her. Completely ignored her. And she just kept asking and asking and asking to the point where it says, his disciples came to him and begged him saying, send her away for she's crying after us. Now, For those of us who know a little bit about Jesus and what he came to do, and probably even having read this story before, we would think this response is strange because this is not how Jesus generally treated people. But to the disciples in this moment, the strange thing would have been for him to acknowledge her. Here was a foreigner, a pagan, and maybe worst of all, a woman. And so they beg Jesus to get rid of her. They're like, okay, Jesus, I know, I know, it's the Canaanite woman. She's gross. We don't want to be around her either. But can you at least just get rid of her for us? Right? (laughs) Now, this is shocking to us who understand Jesus, but the disciples were probably saying amen at this point. Like, this is how they viewed the world. Now, we're going to pause this story right here. And I want us to go back to the previous story just earlier in this chapter. And we don't have time to read the whole thing today, so I'm just going to kind of summarize what happened. But you can read it on your own um, later on. So the Pharisees come to Jesus. This is back when they're still in Capernaum. And they were complaining about the disciples. So the Pharisees come to Jesus and they're like, Hey, your disciples aren't doing the ceremonial hand washing before they eat their meal. And, and this is something that has been passed on. It's a tradition of the elders. And we just really don't like that. You know, this was evidence right here that like the COVID hand washing thing was a biblical thing before it was ever, ever a thing in our culture today. Um, but uh, the Pharisees were complaining about Jesus' disciples that they weren't washing their hands the correct way. And Jesus comes back at them and he exposes their hypocrisy. And he's like, you're complaining about this, but look at all this junk that you guys do. And then he quoted this passage from the book of Isaiah, and they referenced uh, that in the video this morning, that describes religious people who honor God with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Now, I love um, what with these videos that, that we showed. They're, it's from something called The Bible Project. You can find all their videos on YouTube. Um, but one of the things that's incredible is they, they point out not just interesting facts about a particular scripture passage, but how all of scripture is connected. 
And one of the things that I was thinking about as I was writing this message is how many times Jesus quoted the Old Testament prophets. Now, what's interesting to me is how often he did that. He quoted them rather than just saying something that he was fully capable of forming himself because ultimately what they said originated from God in the first place, right? But God gave it to these prophets first, knowing that one day Jesus would quote them. And why that's so significant is everybody who was hearing what Jesus had to say, they were hearing the words of men that were revered and respected throughout their history. Great men of God, men like Isaiah and King David and Moses. And Jesus was quoting them and using their words. And because he was doing that, now he had authority in what was being said. That They had to listen, that it grabbed their attention. So Jesus is quoting Isaiah to them and, and using his words against them. And um, then Jesus says something profound, and I'm just going to read this in verse 10. It says, And he called the people to him, and he said, Hear and understand. It's not what goes in the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. Now something really weird happens, okay? So, so just remember, the Pharisees came to Jesus. They started complaining about his disciples that they weren't following the right hand-washing rules. And they rebuked Jesus in that way. And then Jesus says to them, it's not what goes in the mouth that defiles a person, but it's what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. And then Jesus' disciples start defending the Pharisees. They're like, hey, Jesus, what are you doing? You're making our, our teachers mad. You're upsetting them. Stop. <laughs> and Jesus has to say to them, listen, guys, you need to stop following them. And, and he uses this illustration. He says, they're like blind guides. And if you keep following them, eventually you're both going to end up in the pit. Peter says, okay, well, explain the parable to us. And Jesus is probably like, what parable were you talking about? <laughs> He's referencing that part where he said, the things that come in your mouth aren't the things that defile you, the things that come out defile you. And so Jesus says, and, and I'm going to paraphrase exactly what he says, but it's pretty accurate translation here. Jesus says to Peter, are you stupid? Okay, he actually says, like, are you dull? Like, are you dense? Like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> and here's the point. He says, what you put in your mouth comes out the other end. These are Jesus' words, not mine. Okay, I'm, I'm summarizing, but he literally says that. But what comes out of the heart, and he references a few things, like evil thoughts, murder, sexual immorality, lying, theft, those things can mess you up. They can defile you. So when you go to the bathroom and you don't wash your hands before dinner, that's gross. But the stuff that comes out of your heart is what really matters. Now let's jump back into the story. Um, remember, Jesus ignored the woman. The disciples want her gone. So they're like, please just get her to leave. And she's a defiled discarded Canaanite woman. Some of you are excited to hear this one. If you're not, don't worry. We're going to get there. 
Pharisees want you to wash your hands, but you have a heart problem. And you're still finding your identity and your heritage as an Israelite. But what really matters is what's in your heart. In fact, Scripture even tells us that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what's in your heart will determine how you behave and what you do. That will determine whether you're right with God, not your adherence to ceremony or to laws. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here. Um, but Jesus isn't done being a jerk to this woman yet. Okay, verse 25, I know that sounds blasphemous. But she came and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, now you're going to see what I mean right here. It's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. <laughs> That's mean. Right now, I mean, we think of dogs, like dogs are like members of our family in today's culture. But back then, dogs were disgusting creatures that wandered around the streets and nobody liked them. Right? Fluffy did not live in your house. Like dogs wandered around the streets. They were dirty. They were disgusting. They were to be avoided. And Jesus just called this woman a dog. All right, just in case you, you missed that, if you thought, well, maybe I'm not understanding this translation, that's what he's doing here. <laughs> now, look how she responds. Uh, honestly, at this point, I think the disciples were probably even like, Jesus, that's a little bit harsh, don't you think? Look how she responds. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. She's like, okay, that's fine. I know you didn't come here for me, but even a crumb of what you have to offer would be worth something to me. Look how Jesus now talks to her. Then Jesus answered her, Oh, woman, great is your faith. I've been sitting here bullying you. Right? And, and your response is an incredible statement of faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. I don't know if that does anything for you, but, man, it moves me. My great-grandpa was an Italian immigrant, and in the later years of his life, he shared his life story, and someone from the church that, that he attended transcribed it and typed it out. And uh, my mom had saved this and had given it to me a couple of years ago. I was looking through some of this stuff, and, and I read through that transcription of, of his life story and his testimony. It was really, really neat to, to read how he came to the United States, and um, one of the things that I noticed about his story was he, he talked about his mother back in Italy who died when he was very young. His family was, was Catholic, and, and he talked about his mother's faith and how she taught them about Jesus and, and brought them to church. But it was very clear from his story that he didn't have any faith of his own as a child, even though she clearly did, that Jesus meant something to her. And what I thought was interesting was that even though um, he referred to his entire family as Catholic, that he recognized that what mattered was the heart. And it wasn't until later on in his life that he came to a saving faith in Christ, that he surrendered his heart to the Lord. You know, we have so many things that we place our identity in. Right? We have a nationalistic identity like the Jews. Um, most of us in here, at least, are American. And most of us, including myself, are proud of that fact. I like being an American. I like a lot of the things about our country. Um, it, we have other identities that we wear, right? We have a, a racial identity. We have an ethnic identity. Uh, I'm a white guy, in case you were wondering. Uh, I have European ancestry. Most of you do, too. 
Some of you have a different color skin, or maybe some of you even immigrated to this country, and that's part of what makes up who you are. We also have a socioeconomic identity. Maybe you think of yourself as middle class, or maybe you think of yourself as wealthy or poor. We also have a political identity, right? In this country, generally, you're either a Republican or a Democrat, and we even have a religious identity, right? If you call yourself a Christian, then there are further divisions within that um, section of Christianity as well. There are denominations. And if you're part of this church, you're a Pentecostal. Some of you are in denial of that. But, <laughs> but you're still here and you're still associated with the rest of us crazies. <laughs> but aren't you glad that when it comes to saving faith in Jesus Christ, absolutely none of that matters? The only thing that matters is what's in your heart. You know, what, what Jesus is doing here is he's saying, Peter, if you don't get this simple parable, I'll show you what it means. I'm going to take you to someone who you see as trash. And I'm going to show you what's in her heart. Now, we're all sitting here thinking, yeah, Peter, you idiot. Right? We would never fail to see value in someone like the disciples did in that moment. You know, as I heard this message a couple of months ago, I was experiencing a lot of conviction. As I'm thinking about the people that often I don't necessarily value the way that God sees them the way that God cares about them. And there are a number of different reasons why I think maybe more highly of myself than of others. And I think if we're being honest here, we can all place ourselves in this boat. Here's a couple questions just to help you get started in case you need the help this morning. First one, do I care about the rest of the world as much as I care about what God does in America? Now, maybe that's an easy one for you. You're like, yeah, okay, that's fine. I can, I can do that. They get harder. <laughs> do I care about the people who look differently than me or have different cultural beliefs? And I know that, like, there's a big divide between black and white in this country, and there's a lot of tension right there now, but this issue is an issue on so many levels. I've even heard like godly Christian people, people that, that I admire and respect say things like, ah, oh, Somalis, I wish they would just leave. Maybe you've heard something similar or thought something similar. Do I care about people who disagree with me politically. I told you it was gonna get harder. <laughs> so I'm not sitting here asking you to change your political views. I'm asking you to see people who disagree with you as Jesus sees them. Now, that may or may not change your politics, but it should change the way that you treat people. And I think we could do a lot better in this country, frankly. Last one, I promise. Do you love people that believe differently than you do? Now, two different potential groups here, right? There are uh, people who believe that salvation is through faith in Christ, and those people are partners. And if we disagree on some things doctrinally, but we agree on the most important things, then not only should we love those people, but we should we should support them and encourage them and cooperate with them and partner with them. Right? That's the reason why we're doing this community worship night because there are a lot of other great churches in this community that are teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And these are our friends and our partners. And we should link arms with them and work together with them. But there are also people who believe differently than us that we're not going to have a, a joint worship night with the local mosque. Okay. 
um, because we believe fundamentally different things than they do. But that doesn't mean that God loves them any less than he loves us. I want to give you an example of God's incredible love for somebody that most of us would discard. As I shared, the the speaker at this retreat shared a a story uh, from somebody that that he knew um, from Kenya. This man's name was Hassan. He was a Muslim in Kenya, and he was dying. He had some disease. They didn't know what it was. They couldn't figure it out. But he was rapidly dying, and so he went to this Muslim medical camp, and um, he had to use the restroom. But they didn't have bathrooms. That, like, if you needed to go to the bathroom, you'd go out in the bush and take care of your business. But uh, they had some, some paper that they would give you that they would use as, as toilet paper. And apparently, um, somebody had given somebody at that camp a Bible at one point. And so not having any value for it as far as scripture goes, they said, well, it's still paper. We might as well use it for something. So they tore out a couple of sheets and handed it to Hassan. He went out in the woods to do his business. And he started looking at this paper and realized that there were words on it. And he started reading those words. And it was John chapter 3 and John chapter 4. Now, Many of you know what's in John chapter 3, right? John 3.16, probably the most famous Bible verse that exists today. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And he kept reading through John chapter 3 and about Nicodemus. And he got to John chapter 4 and it was the story of the Samaritan woman. Anybody remember that story? How Jesus went out of his way to meet this woman at this well and told her everything that she had ever done in her life. And there was a moment of repentance and she went and told everyone about the goodness and the faithfulness of Jesus, that the Messiah had come. As he read this thing, he he said a prayer in that moment. He said, listen, listen, Jesus, everything that I've been taught about you is that you're a great prophet. But what I read today seems different than that. If this is who you really are, then heal me as a sign and I'll follow you. Instantly, he was healed of his sickness. He checked himself out of that clinic, went back home to his family, led his wife and daughter to the Lord And started telling his neighbors all about Jesus. Now, unfortunately, the story doesn't end there. Because the Muslims in the area found out what he was doing, that he was sharing the gospel. And while he was away at work, they went into his home and they murdered his wife and daughter. He came home to find that they were dead. And he fled from the village and headed to Nairobi, started wandering the streets, having no support, having no friends that were Christians, having nothing. And he just wandered and wandered until God actually led him to the gate of this school. It's called East Africa Theological Seminary. It's an Assemblies of God Bible school in Nairobi, Kenya. And he knocked on the door just by the leading of the Holy Spirit, told the people his story. They accepted him. They brought him in. They started to teach him and trained him, and today he is a pastor in Kenya. You know, imagine what had to take place for this man to get a hold of John chapter 3 and John chapter 4 as a piece of toilet paper. Now, if you believe that that's coincidence, I have some property that I'd like to sell you, okay? <laughs> right? <laughs> this, that's ridiculous. God cared enough about Hassan 
to find him in the most unlikely place. Now, if God cares that much about him, and he cares that much about you and me, and God wants us to have his heart, shouldn't we think that way about other people and see them as the treasure that they are? See the world around us as an opportunity to show God's love. We're going to end today doing things a little bit differently than we normally do. We're not going to sing any songs. We're just going to have a quiet moment. I'm just going to ask you to quiet your heart today and to just listen to the Holy Spirit and let him convict you. If there's something in your life, if you're not loving people the way that God would have you love them, Let's just let him speak to us today and identify those areas. Maybe you can use the the questions I posed earlier as a starting point. Maybe the Lord is leading you thinking about somebody else. But as we do that, too, I also want to speak to those who are maybe questioning if God really loves me and God cares about me. Can I tell you something today? He does. He desperately does wants to have a relationship with you. He loved you so much that he sent his son to die for you. And today, in this moment, if you're willing to surrender your life to him, he wants to invite you to be part of his family. Let's pray, and then I'll just take take a moment, and then I'll just close us in a couple of minutes here. Lord, we thank you for this incredible story. And Lord, even more than that, we thank you for your incredible love for us. We thank you that that you found each one of us, Lord, and demonstrated that love to us. But I pray that you would give us your heart. God, that we would begin to see people as you see them. And Lord, that our eyes would be your eyes. Help us not to get hung up on the things that don't matter. But help us to be relentless in our pursuit of your heart. Lord, I pray that this week, as we're being obedient, as we're listening to your Holy Spirit right now, that you would give us opportunities to show love to people this week, even people who are difficult to love. And Lord, help us to be bold in our faith as we share that love with others. Lord, I pray for anyone in this room right now that is struggling with, with um, that feeling of being isolated or alone or, or unloved. Lord, remind them of your love for them and your invitation to 
them right now. Speak to their heart today. Show them how much you love them in this moment. Lord, we thank you for this day. We love you, Jesus. In your name, amen.